Shame is never forgotten and betrayal never forgiven. Both must be avenged, such as the unyielding honour of the Dowie. The dwarves of the old world bring their unique subterranean warfare to the surface, resulting in a unique playstyle characterised by nearly invincible infantry, supported by cutting edge weaponry and aircraft. Welcome to Elven Plot Armour and this is the Dwarf Mastery Guide where we will quickly and concisely run through every elite strategy to help you dominate on Legendary and discover why the dwarves are among Total Warhammer's most popular factions. With a steady and methodical early game, the dwarves can blast their economy and research into the stratosphere, and pretty much blast anything for that matter. Let's get straight into the strengths. Don't let the hide fool you, they are very physically strong and resilient. Even their basic soldier is capable of wearing heavy armour without slowing them down. Their thick skin and solid frame grants them an extra 10-15% to 15 extra hit points. They resist a third of all spell damage and have incredible leadership. They are famed for their stubbornness and many a player versing them has rage quit because that army just won't break. These factors add up to them having some of the best defensive infantry on offer, their signature Ironbreaker is essentially a 40k Terminator, widely regarded as the best line holder in the entire game. And standing behind those are some of the best missile and artillery units, from their finely tuned crossbows, guns and explosive artillery, Dwarven engineering has produced some of the most devastating developments the world has ever seen. But they don't just build war machines, they can also forge armour with magical runes, and any bad stats that any of their characters have are immediately foregone because you can just simply craft a whole new suit of armor and weaponry for them to march out on. You can outfit any character to deal with any situation. So if you enjoy RPGs with lots of influence on the characters, this is a great race to play. Their research and technology tree is enormous, but fortunately they have a ton of ways of fast tracking this. This not only compounds your military, but also your economy, which is absolutely incredible, and a level of trade and resources, which makes the High Elves envious in some areas. But what about the cons? Well, they're definitely are some. Being stubborn, the Dwarven resistance to magic means they don't use the conventional winds of magic at all. Instead, they use their runic system, which is unique and fun, but nowhere near as devastating. Runes are excellent for crafting, but on the battlefield, they don't quite reach the damage levels of their contemporaries. And while it's still good, instead you'll be rewarded by high execution maneuvers with devastating heavy weapons. And this is where they are strong, because in the cavalry department, well, what cavalry department? Grass grows really poorly underground, so cavalry aren't just impractical financially, but also militarily. The Dowie realms are enclosed, hazardously rocky, or both, so since a horse with a broken leg is put down, there's enough good reasons not to bring horses there without having a boozed up dwarf riding them. It's okay, we don't need horses if we've got a army of roided up miniature bikies wearing full plate without being slowed down, right? Well, here's the catch, they were never fast to begin with, dwarves are slow. Coupled with very underwhelming charge bonuses means offensive infantry are more of a reserved counter matchup than an actual tool you'll use decisively. This means you'll be having to shoot those fleeing units in the back because chasing after them is probably more demoralizing for you than it is for them. And you do not want demoralized dwarves because every grudge must be avenged. Any slight against the dwarves honor goes into the infamous Great Book of Grudges. This is really important because the Dowie honor is central to their identity and unavenged grudges are a torturous itch that must be sated with glorious retribution. Any raid, lost territory, betrayal will likely go in the book and produce a quest that needs to be resolved to keep it down. Grudge severity will increase over time, but the penalties take quite a while to actually add up. When you have no grudge severity, you enjoy bonuses across your entire empire. But if you leave too many grudges unavenged for too long, you will have increasing penalties. So don't lose your overall direction on avenging grudges, but it should be something you seek to actively do when possible. The best tip is to avoid grudges, don't get them in the first place. Don't expand too quickly and overexpose yourself so you don't lose wars. Just a quick reminder guys, if you are enjoying the video, please consider liking and subscribing, it really helps out. Ask any question in the comments, I answer everything. And if you'd like to talk strategy, feel free to join the Discord. The last weakness of the Dowie is that they live in some of the most competitive and hostile lands around. Fortunately, all the Dowie enjoy the movement of the underway, allowing them to pass under mountains, regions, and assault or defend the settlement faster than any land army could ever reach. The 
Problem is, most of their enemies are Greenskins or Skaven in here who also have the ability to do this. So it is very, very necessary to first scout out with a hero, just move out less than half their distance, see what's out there, and this way you can either react, hide an ambush stance to get them if they underpass, or know that it's safe to proceed and take their territory. As the dwarves, you should be aiming to centralize inside the mountains and not expand too far too fast. Make a perimeter of faction capitals, or build up walls and minor settlements, and provide a defensive band which will help protect you from underway invasions. That being said, let's meet the cast. The mountain realm of the dwarves is joined together by a series of large stone strongholds, or carracks. In the capital sits the High King Thorgrim Grudgebearer. He carries the Great Book of Grudges himself atop his throne, and having a list of all the bad things done to you in front of you all the time explains why he's so pissed off all the time. He receives extra bonuses for completing grudges, buffs to administration, and can rock armies specialized in elite armored infantry. He's a powerful lord and a great start if you're looking to confederate the other realms. Just north of him is Ungram Iron Fist, the Slayer King, who begins in the Slayer Keep, and this is the location of a divine shrine where the Slayer Oath is taken from mourning comrades, a disgraceful loss, or even just a single shameful failure. A dwarf's honor can be tormented so far that they'll pledge their life to Grimnir in the pursuit of glorious death in battle, forsaking friends, comforts, and even armor. Instead, they go full midlife crisis mode, sparking their hair and getting a bunch of tattoos. The slayers that do survive the battles tend to be quite faint because they will increase the impossible odds they go up against, going from unlikely battles, soloing trolls, giants, or even dragons. Ungram is a fearless warrior whose army can enjoy some increased speed and buffs when using slayers. Now any faction can build slayers but you don't really need to now because over time as grudge severity increases you will have a pool of five regular slayers and five giant slayers and these will replenish over time so this is the best way to recruit slayers without using a build slot. Thoric Ironbrow is the Master Rune Lord, the essential caster lord, who has a very unique campaign, scouring the world for artifacts to forge into exclusive items. This Indiana Jones style quest for overpowered items is actually one of the most compelling campaigns in the entire game, but it certainly isn't for beginners. He specializes in crossbows, forging, and rune casters. Moving way further west, we have Belagar Ironhammer. Once upon a time, the most difficult campaign in the entire game, but thanks to a series of buffs and a reworked map, he now manages is a small but highly elite crack army with a singular goal recapture Karak 8 Peaks. This is a campaign of very small but highly specialized armies. He brings a group of special ethereal ancestral bodyguards, specializing in shields and stealthy skirmish units. And finally, a dwarf who needs no introduction at all. A name that echoes in the old world as much as the magazine series that his name would take, the legendary white dwarf Grombrador. Mythically appearing in the darkest hour, his fame will help muster forces to save the day before seemingly vanishing again. He's believed to be the walking spirit of a king so often that he was friends with Malekith before he turned into a dick. After Malekith promised there would be no war between dwarves and elves, and then starting war between dwarves and elves, Grombrindle has a grudge to settle. Fortunately, in Warhammer 3, he starts off on Malekith's doorstep, so there's your first trophy. Although in a very hostile starting location, Grombrindle and his faction form an absolute powerhouse that can take on most things. Although if you only got to play one faction, I would probably recommend Thorgrim. I must insist that Grombrindle's campaign is a must play. Now, all the Dwarf Lords can be easily confederated, except Grombrindle, just purely by the fact he's on the other side of the world, but all the others close together can be confederated, and this might happen towards the middle to the late game. But I must quickly emphasize, do not get carried away confederating the minor factions, because this could really overextend you early. Any faction trying to confederate this early is really on the ropes, and you will take their territory and probably quickly lose it. Absolutely confederate everyone, just don't rush into it, and make sure you can counter the armies that are close to that border. Now to go through the military and buildings in my normal format, starting at tier 1 to uncover the story of your campaign. Starting with basic units, and you're going to find a dwarf way more likely drinking at a pub than doing voluntary training. They don't have a glorious basic militia like Kislev or the Wood Elves. Instead we have the basic miner, literally a guy who's not come back from his lunch break, but bear with me, these guys can still rock the lightest armor, which comes at a whopping 80. So does this make them 
them a staple troop? Well, absolutely not. They're fighting with a work utensil, have no shields, and are really bad at parrying attacks with said utensil. That said, it is still a pickaxe, so boasts very good armor piercing, so even if you only have a couple, you can use them to counter charge into the flanks in those basic fights, but you should only be using these if you have no dwarf warrior options available. Given the choice, you should always bring the blasting charge option. Either have them standing up the front to unleash the blasting charge, or have fire at will off to avoid friendly fire, position them in the flank when the enemy is blobbed, and nuke them. But dwarf warriors will last you a lot longer. And to build dwarf warriors, you will need a barracks, and you should always, in the early stages, have a barracks at least only one or two provinces away from where you are attacking, because a dwarf warrior is one of the best tier 1 units in the entire game. Always bring the shielded version because you're not likely to come across armor this early. The dwarf warrior will typically cover between a quarter and half of your early armies, and it will do an absolute dynamite job at it. For your starting lord, I highly recommend putting two, if not three points into dwarf warriors. Now combine this with the dwarven warrior research and increase these stats by another three, and now you are able to dice up orcs with your basic dwarf warrior infantry. Now I can see some of you are screwing up your faces thinking why would you do this? Well I can guarantee you are still stuck in Warhammer 2 where melee was not that good. In Warhammer 3, melee is very very necessary. Now yes you could start investing immediately on your range units, but these range units do enough in the early stages and they won't really help you win those really clutch battles, and having a front line of dwarf warriors will be the thing that often saves your army from collapsing. If you're new to dwarves, I put my name on it, put your first two points in the red line into dwarf warriors, and get that dwarf warrior research to give yourself a sturdy backbone, and all your garrisons will benefit from this upgrade. So this is only one research item on a massive tree. Are there any ways we can learn it quicker? Well, absolutely there is. Many factions get access to the student follower, having your research off, not researching anything, and then leveling up a character. The best way to do this is to switch it off at the start of your turn, do all of your battles, giving you a chance to rank up, and you will have a roughly 15% chance to get the student as well as the archivist follower. That's right, the dwarves get two followers that can increase research, both gained from ranking up heroes. For this reason, you should try to have at least three heroes in any army. As you can see here, you can easily get above a thousand percent research. As your rate goes up, some of the research that took many turns to get will be done in a single turn, and you should target these. Now, why is that? Well, the reason is, the moment you press end turn is when the research is done. So while the AI is having its turn, you're not researching anything if it only took one turn. This means if your heroes level up over the end turn, or have any battles, those level ups will have a chance to roll a student or an archivist follower. Keep following this process and I promise you will snowball followers and here we are in the late game with virtually every single hero and character with the archivist follower. But there's one more thing you can do, the trade ancestor of Grimnir. This can come on heroes as well as lords, and just frequently check your recruitment pool. If you see there's a new Thane with a 5% research buff, then just disband that other level 2 Thane and get this one instead. You want as many of this trait as possible. You can simply hire the lord and then disband them straight away and you will retain that 5% increase to research, and believe me this will really really add up. If you really want to cheese the system, you can just keep hiring lords that don't have the traits and disbanding them, and this will roll new lords that may have the trait even quicker. This might be too cheesy for some players, but either way, always keep your eye out for this trait and hire them even if you disband them later, because having lots of lords in your pool ready to go is very helpful for the dwarves to defend their wide provinces. Make sure the other early skills you get do include Iron Willed, which will give you an extra 30% replenishment, which you'll really need because the dwarves somewhat struggle to get replenishment. Once you reach tier 2, you will unlock the Quarreler, their staple crossbow damage dealers. This unit can fight melee better than it has any right to, and it has a shield so it can actually trade with other archers really easily. Honestly, these plus dwarf warriors will absolutely have you covered, except for the next unit which is the grudge thrower, an excellent catapult. You only need one or two of these, but this will force the enemy to come to you. It's very accurate, does a good amount of damage. Now, unless the climate is orange or you're in desperate need of public order, you want to avoid building the tavern, but if you need to, you could do it a lot worse because it produces dwarven beer, a tradable resource. 
Wars have been started between dwarven clans for insulting the taste of another's brew. So it's some serious stuff. And due to their tanky constitution, their ale is at such a strength, if a human got hammered on it, they'd either end up dead or permanently disabled. Some brews are at such a purity, they've been used to power their machines. But the beer also has some logistical value. It's a one-stop good, able to nourish the dowry from thirst as well as hunger. They believe it hones their minds and martial prowess, which probably explains why they tend to miss a bit in Malay. When completing your provinces, go for the growth edict, but if you are near a border, I highly recommend the recruitment edict, allowing you one more recruitment slot, which is absolutely vital anywhere you have the barracks. As you take territory occupied, don't loot, don't sack it, just take it with the dwarves, unless you're going to sack it and then take it purely to gift it to someone else. In your capital, consider building the growth buildings, but outside of this, improving your tradable resources and economy might be the better step, and you might need multiple armies, so don't forget your economy. If you're in your own territory, when you win a battle, opt to get the growth boost. This is very nice, unless in enemy territory, in which case you may as well take the gold. Because dwarves believe any stick needs a ludicrously sized axe or hammerhead on the top of it, there are no spears to be found in the Dowie realms. However, slayers are your anti-large unit. If you see yourself fighting a lot of cavalry or need some extra bite, once you hit tier 3, you can unlock the slayer building, but don't get this because you get slayers for free, just recruit these from your global recruitment. If you need armor piercing, at tier 3 you get the Thunderer, one of the best gunpowder units, so it will need line of sight to unleash its volleys. However, this will comprise the backbone of most of your mid-game armies, and are your answer to armor, and pretty much everything else. Now the Thunderer comes from the gunpowder building line, and here you will also find at tier 3 the Iron Drake. You only want one, absolute two units of these tops. They are absolutely devastating. You have a hero tar pit the enemy, group the unit around, and then eviscerate them with fire. And direct shots of this unit will still deliver pretty effective firepower against armored units of lords. At tier 3, it's time to get some heroes. The Thane is your run-of-the-mill tanky melee hero. Obviously very effective in a missile-based faction, you can pin a large unit in place. Their signature hero is absolutely the Master Engineer, and you want one of these in every army. They can replenish the ammo on any unit. You can kit them out with a shotgun, or probably better, on the back lines with your artillery, with a sniper doing excellent ranged AP damage, using ballistics calibration, which will increase the efficiency of all ranged units, including artillery, in a given area. They increase the movement of your armies and have grenades that slow the enemy in battle, boost every unit's ammunition and damage. But even still, the building you want to prioritize in any settlement is the runesmith building. This will increase your local recruitment by one, as well as give you another runesmith. So dwarves don't use the conventional magic system, instead they cast runes. Casting a rune will mean you can't cast anything for a minute, and you won't be able to cast that same spell for about 90 seconds. This is way less punchy than dropping a ton of spells in succession, like you can with conventional magic. However, what these spells do are still very good. The signature rune of Wraith and Ruin is just a clear explosion that anyone can get behind. And yes, this is the one that you'll probably use. You'll find yourself usually going between one or two runes at a time. Fortunately, most of the runes are area of effect, so a boost to armor or melee attack can actually have a compound effect on your front lines. The rune negation allows you to reduce damage on a single unit by 40%, but the subtle strength in rune smiths is their buffs. One rune Smith can buff the armor of your entire army and you can have another one to sharpen weapons. Just make sure you have the runesmith leave and rejoin the army so they can do the correct order because they scout by default. Now on top of this add the debuffs to armor as well as missile and magic resistance. Now we can see why having runesmiths on the battlefield can actually have such a profound effect. The only thing is their space stats aren't that great but that doesn't matter because you can build equipment that will give them great stats. Welcome to the forge. Controlling different resources will allow you to forge more unique items. The currency used to earn these is called oath gold and you really don't need to try that hard to get it. Simply by winning battles or building the runesmith building which you should be doing everywhere but possibly the best thing you can spend early is the character runes and these are a buff that you can apply to three different characters or a massive buff to a single character. Giving your characters an extra 7 defense plus 20 armor 
all this doesn't even use up an equipment slot. You have three unique rune slots that you can apply to this, but more importantly, you can equip your dwarfs to suit what they'll be doing. You can give them flame attacks, anti-large if they're fighting beasts, and soon this will be no oath gold to you at all, and you now have a really tanky character. You can customize your entire army to take on any foe you want, making your catapults do more explosive damage. The best item in my opinion is one that you can build multiple of called the Iron Warden's Tankard. This gives the wielder regeneration, which in this game is incredibly overpowered. So if you want an easy tanky character, get the Veteran's Hammer, the Ranger's Cloak, the Veteran's Flask, and the Iron Warden's Tankard. Now throw some character runes on them, and now you have a walking god that's only level 1. Make sure you put the Master Rune of Spite on your main character, because this deals damage over time to anyone around them. Without any cavalry to harass, dwarves are pretty much dependent on their gyrocopters. Now, you don't even need to field gyrocopters, but just like cavalry, they will give you that extra movement and utility that you often need. Just make sure you always keep them moving side to side. If they're under fire, do not turn on the spot. Make sure you fly forward first, because they will start to wobble, they'll spill their beer on the controls, it's not a pretty sight. Personally, always bring the brimstone cannon. This isn't bad against infantry, it's just also really good against large units. But if you can hang on, let's get into tier 4, you can get the Gyro Bomber. This is a single unit rather than a squad and this makes it way easier to dodge enemy missile fire. This is much more nimble and as the name suggests you can drop several bombs on top of enemy units. Now wait for the enemy to crash against your front line and then drop them down to maximize the payload. The onboard gun does some pretty good damage as well. You can harass archers, just make sure you don't leave it unattended and if in doubt just keep it behind your back line and in reserve. As you hit tier 4, it should all be the runesmith building and the gunsmith building in every capital. This frees up your other slots for economy, as well as the trade building, which will compound your trade to levels that even the high elves could be envious of. At tier 4, the runesmith building produces your high tier infantry, so you can knock down any barracks that are in this province. And at tier 5, the runesmith building will give you plus 1 global recruitment slot for each of these buildings. Now, why do you want the gunsmith building in every capital? At tier 3, you really don't have the space, but at tier 4 and definitely tier 5, you will. And once you have 10 of the same building type, you get a reduction to the global recruit time and now you see the end game strategy to be able to globally recruit all the dwarves elite units which come from the runesmith and gunpowder building lines and this will allow you to hire entire stacks of thunderers and iron drakes in a single turn but also the iron drake torpedo variant now this is something as well you only want to at absolute most four in a single army but they can volley a shot of grenades over your front line of thunderers i typically don't recommend the hall of oaths building until tier 5 at earliest because you just really don't need a lot of thanes. Instead of this building, just build the engineering building to increase your research rate and number of engineers. Because those priority buildings will unlock the organ gun and iron breaker. The organ gun is quite simply the dwarves best artillery piece, rapidly firing shells that just eviscerate anything they're targeting. The heroes, monsters, cavalry just absolutely get shredded to pieces by this, it's not even pretty. Essentially all the late game threats can be basically nuked before they even get close. Their elite hammer unit are very good as an anti-demon unit, dealing magic attacks, but the hammers are also outshone by the signature unit, the iron breaker. Watching orcs try to crack these guys open is like trying to slay a washing machine with the tennis racket, they just do not die. And furthermore, they have a blasting charge, so they will literally nuke the first line of infantry that try to engage with them. Just remember, turn off that research at the start of your turn, and if you can learn a single turn technology, this gives you a chance to get more followers over the end turn. This is such an immersive faction to play, and I really hope this has given you some guidance on how to play them to the highest level. This is Love on Plot Armor, thank you so much for watching, and go avenge those grudges.